Right, for our next segment, we've moved away from the land and out onto some of Croatia's largest islands, with apologies to Brach. I do have a trip planned there, but for now, nothing doing. But I will say, it has far fewer Venetian structures than the two islands we'll be focusing on. You may have already seen our travel episodes on these two, a another puzzling example of how this platform is less than entirely equitable with how it pushes things out. Um, amusingly, at the time of writing, our Croatia episodes are doing way better than we ever expected, while the Venetian episodes clearly don't have that sweet SEO clickability. So hey, if you're here and you're feeling a little generous, jump in the playlist of Venetian Republic episodes. It'll make this one make far more sense, but if you could also leave a comment while you're there, that'd be a big help. We're gonna start with VAR. The island of VAR is extremely long, much of it quite thin, and like Korchula, there were ancient Greek colonists here. In the case of VAR, they founded what is now Starigrad, and incredibly, the layout of the field system visible from above is a survivor from these ancient Greek colonists and a UNESCO site. But this is all a bit too far back for this particular episode, and these episodes don't really work when we're dealing with things for which we don't have any footage, so we're mostly just going to be focusing on the capital. Sorry Starigrad, sorry Verboska, but we've been over this, you are lovely, but far smaller, and we didn't really have time in just the one day. The city of Var itself is a great place for a harbour. Other than the natural cove with the raised ground above it suitable for a fortification, the Pakleni Islands also provide shelter for the harbour from excessively rough waters. While details for Var, following the loss of Roman authority in the region are a little hard to come by, piracy was one of the defining features of the Adriatic all the way from ancient times to the Industrial Revolution. While Var is a comparatively short sail from the mainland towns of Split and Trogir, as far as raids are concerned, you'd really have to look to your own defences, and with smaller populations on these islands, often the only recourse the Slavic settlers had was to settle further inland. The Venetians briefly had control of the island from 1147, and shortly after their conquest it was established as a diocese, though control would soon pass back to the Hungarians. When the Venetians regained control in 1278, one of the main changes was to move the administrational centre from Starigrad to what is now the town of Var, to administer both the whole island but also Vis and Brach nearby. 1278 was also when the first Venetian fortifications were built on the site of the fort. We believe there were more ancient fortifications here long before this, just based on finds, but we're not as clear on the form these took. The first town walls were also begun at this stage, but they didn't get very far, as 50 years later in 1326, we have records of the Venetians insisting the townspeople pay for the completion of the walls. Both the town wall we see now and the fort are the result of later upgrades in the 14 and 1500s. For the next stage, I'm leaning on you having seen some of the previous episodes in this series, the very broad strokes of Venetian control in the area, it's back and forth with the Hungarians until 1358 when the Treaty of Zada wipes out all Venetian control in Dalmatia, except Oh, psych, it's now the early 1400s, the Hungarians are ruled by a Neapolitan monarchy, and it's not going so super. They sell their Dalmatian claims back to Venice, and by around 1420, Venice is in control of the whole coast, barring the Republic of Ragusa, the exception to the Venetian rule. Yeah, do go watch that episode, it's a good one. So, from around 1420, the town of Var took on a pivotal role in the region, both for its strong fortifications, but also as the seat of a diocese. However, something we have to talk about the rebellion of Var from 1510 to 1514 is of particular interest. One of the most difficult things to pin down in this series is how much the Venetians are determining the culture and how much continuity we see from the largely Slavic population. And no two Dalmatian cities had quite the same experience. Even as a significant Venetian administrative centre, Var would also be significant as a cultural hub for Croat culture, producing many noteworthy poets and playwrights. And hey, look no further than the centuries the Adriatic cities had spent either fighting for independence from Venice or being passed between regional powers from Hungary to Bosnia. Even after 1420, where the question of control was pretty permanently established with Venice, there was still an undercurrent of dissatisfaction. And this was not helped that Venice itself was essentially an oligarchy. You know, on the one hand, when compared to the fractious, often murderous conflicts that would flare up around the monarchies of Europe, I mean, that's not to say that the noble families of Venice weren't also fractious and murderous, but with hindsight, when you look at the final scores, the squabbles and intrigue of the Venetian state look like a children's nativity play compared to the all-out civil wars that could break out elsewhere. The Venetian Republic was politically close to the brink many times, 
but all in all, they held themselves together surprisingly well. But this was not because of a great degree of fairness or equity. No, Venice was unquestionably an oligarchy with a clique of noble families who clung onto power and authority and did their best to prevent others from lower-born circles to ascend to the upper echelons of power. And in the various colonies Venice controlled, this was doubly so. Venetian noble families having conspicuous wealth and authority over the locals, except now the divisions of language, culture, church practice and all sorts were far more pronounced and the rebellion of Navarre is one such case of this boiling over. While the exact causes are not entirely clear, it's been attributed to the abuse of women on the island by the Venetian nobles. Eventually, Mattia Ivanic would emerge to lead the uprising. Not only were the nobles captured and executed, but this wasn't just a brainless rabble. The Croats assembled around 2,000 men and 30 galleys, which patrolled the coast, securing their hold on the island. The rebels would maintain control for the next four years with several attempts by the Venetians to retake control of the island. It was only in 1514 when the Venetians finally sent 15 war galleys that they finally managed to break rebel control. Now, spoiler alert, spoilers from history. The rebellion essentially failed to enact permanent social change. The leaders of the rebellion, with the exception of Ivanich, were captured, hung, and the rebellion put down. But it nearly affected nearby colonies too, and for a while it did look plausible that Venice could lose control of the region to popular local rule. Now, while this is perhaps an oversimplification, with the continuing threat from the Ottomans, control by a power that could command a modestly large navy must have made Venetian control somewhat more palatable. Var was attacked by an Ottoman fleet in 1571, the same fleet that would go on to be defeated at the Battle of Lepanto shortly after. But as well as sacking Starigrad and Verboska, they laid waste to almost the entire town. Some of the population managed to hold out in the fortress, but the town had to be almost entirely rebuilt. And Historically, the Adriatic had always proved a precarious place to live, be it pirates or the Genoese or even occasional Islamic raids in the earlier centuries, as well as the looming threat of an Ottoman navy in the latter. A strong power with the resources to build substantial fortifications was hard to say no to, even if it did mean being ruled by an often aloof foreign power mainly looking to serve its own interests. Anyway, getting to some specifics about the Venetian architecture on VAR, the views as you enter the harbour, I mean, unless you've docked elsewhere on the island, you are treated to much the same display that the sailors were rewarded with 400 years ago. Let's have a quick supercut. As you disembark onto VAR from the port, one of the first things you see is the Arsenale. I feel like I need to redefine these terms from time to time. The Arsenale in a Venetian town is where the ships were built, repaired and all things like that, hence why you need a pretty sizable warehouse space or few. It's absolutely huge and it's rather elegant. The earliest iteration of this was built soon after 1278, but it's had to be altered and rebuilt several times, including after the Ottomans burnt it down in the 1571 assault. However, from 1612, a theatre was built on the upper level, and this has been updated and augmented over the years, including a near-complete refit at the end of the 1800s. Next to that, you're in St. Stephen's Square, and the houses that line this are very beautiful and elegant, but your eye can't help but be drawn to the cathedral at the far end. St. Stephen's Cathedral is on the site of a church from the 500s, but after the diocese had been transferred from Starigrad to the town of Var that the Venetians were developing, a new church was built beginning in the 1300s. The structure you can currently see is mainly from the 15 to 1600s as, yes, like much of VAR, it needed rebuilding after the 1571 raid. Also, like a lot of cathedrals we're seeing in the Adriatic, I'm afraid we didn't get any footage from the inside. There are several more churches of note around the town. On opposite sides of the harbour, you have the Franciscan Monastery built in the 1400s, and on the western side, the Church of Veneranda. While this was built as a church in 1561, the French in the 1800s turned it into a little fortlet, given its position near the mouth of the harbour. Then, in the middle, you have the Dominican Monastery with the distinctive tower from the Church of St. Mark, which is ruined now. Oh, and we should mention the town Logier. Um, there had been one on this site since at least 1289, but say it with me now, it needed rebuilding after 1571, and the current appearance is thanks to work in the early 1700s by architect Trippen Bokanich. 
but since we've been putting this off, we have to climb the hill up to the fort. On your way, you'll pass through the pretty impressive town walls. You enter through the Porta Maestra, completed late 13 or early 1400s. Now, the town has long since expanded out of their walls, so their function isn't as obvious. Even though the paintings of Konrad von Grunenberg are somewhat stylized, you can see this painting of Var from around 1486. This, from Carmocho Giovanni Francesco in around 1574, is a little more instructive. You can see the settlement on the hill fortified by the walls to the east and west, but also the rest of the town, including St. Stephen's Square, below near the water. As we mentioned earlier, these walls were built gradually, and seemingly by the time they were completed, they would soon be too small to encompass the entirety of the thriving town. But at the top of the enclosure, they link as a curtain wall to the fort. It's impossible to imagine VAR without it. It's an incredible structure, preserved in great condition, sitting proudly above the town. It's believed that this would have been a fortified position as far back as the Illyrians, but we can't be certain other than there was some ancient settlement at this spot. The descriptions also allude to some traces of a Byzantine fortress from around the 500s being visible on the southern side. I'm not exactly clear what they're referring to there. Anyway, work began on a new fort in 1278, but if it was anything like the walls, it may have not been completed for a while. At any rate, what you're seeing now is largely the product of the construction in 1550 making it a much sturdier structure. And since that one date keeps coming up, you'll know this was not a moment too soon because, yes, this is one of the things that did not need a rebuild after 1571. The residents of Var were able to hold out in the fort against the Ottoman raid, which had laid waste to most of the town. But... There was tremendous damage from a lightning strike to a powder magazine in 1579. Which meant, right, get the broom, turns out Vars Fortress is going to need fixing along with just everything else. You can see the shape of the bastions is just a little different from the typical round bastions you'll see on other Venetian forts, and yes, those battlements were a later Austrian addition after 1797. And also, like elsewhere, they reworked some of the interior of the fort with a barracks and other buildings. We should just have a super cup before we go. So that's VAR. It's about time for us to head south and east towards Korchla. And once again, we have Greek colonists who called the island Melana Korkira, or Black Korkira, after the dense pine forests here. And we have the receipts. For example, the Lombarda Thes. The Lombarda Sifisma. The Lombarda Sefisma is a stone inscription concerning the founding of a colony sometime between the 3 to 200 BC. As above, the Western Roman or Byzantine control in the area was not sufficient to prevent either the settlement of Slavs on the island or the later influx of Narantine pirates that would call these islands home. And this rather Wild West environment was dangerous and unpredictable for everyone, but most of all, Venetian shipping attempting to pass the area. And so, when in around 1000 AD, the Venetians sent the fleet headed by Doge Pietro II or Silo in an attempt to curb the piracy in the region, this was also designed to subjugate the coastal towns to the banner of Venice. However, as you've seen from just about every town so far, from Istria to Dubrovnik, while this campaign was a seminal moment in the Adriatic and a major statement of intent from the Venetians, its conclusion was far from final, and Korchler would come into the minor principality of Zahumle. And yeah, best of luck trying to find any decent images that represent the principality of Zahumle. There's nothing. Not that it hugely matters, as control of the island was still far from certain. In the 1100s, Pepone Zorzi, a Venetian noble, took control of the island and attempted to incorporate it into the Republic of Venice. Um, at this point, the population of the entire island may have only been around 2,500. The citizens were attempting to leverage autonomy with the Charter of Korchler in 1214, but while the island enjoyed some degree of independence, it couldn't entirely keep itself disentangled from the other powers in the region. In 1300, the island had its own diocese established, separate from that of Var. 
Just before the Venetians had full and final control, there was a brief period from 1413 as the previous Hungarian control, which was set out by the Treaty of Zada, went back to the Venetians. The islands of Var, Brach and Korchla came under the Republic of Ragusa, but this loose arrangement didn't hold and by 1420 the islands would be under Venetian control. While I want to get onto the town, a conversation about Venetian Korchla has made the conversation about Marco Polo almost inevitable. But funny thing, and there's been quite a bit of literature on this, basically the tradition that Marco Polo was born on Korchla, yeah, we have pretty high confidence this is a fabrication, but it's one that continues to be massaged by the island, which, yeah, still leans on the idea even with this, quote, house of Marco Polo, which it transpires, by the way, is nothing of the kind. In this way, the conversation is not, was Marco Polo born here? I mean, basically, there's no good evidence he was. We're pretty sure he was born in Venice. The conversation is really, why is this discredited narrative about Marco Polo being allowed to continue mostly unchallenged? Is it just tourism dollars? Is, is that it? I mean, the burden of proof lands squarely in the court of anyone who wants to continue to propose that he was born on Korchla, and they are not meeting that burden, not by a long way. You know, the closest link Marco Polo has to the islands is his possible involvement in the Battle of Curzola, at which he was present and taken prisoner by the Genoese. Probably. But even this is not entirely certain. We know he was imprisoned by the Genoese, but he might have been captured in an earlier engagement. Uh, by the way, this is not the best place for it. We've not really explored the Venetian conflict with the Genoese. I had a whole segment written, but this is really not the time or place. So we're going to outsource that story. And as we've been promising, this series is going to have some accompanying long form episodes where we really take a deep dive into the history of the Venetian Republic end to end. So we'll have a chance for even more then. We'll just briefly take a moment to look at the Battle of Curzola. If you hadn't picked up, that's just the Venetian name for Korchla, and it was a significant moment in the island's history, taking place in the strait between Korchla and the Pelgesec Peninsula in around September 1298, between the Venetian Admiral Andrea Dandolo and the Admiral Lambadoria for the Genoese. It proved catastrophic for the Venetians, who lost nearly their entire fleet of 95 ships, and yet, as they would so often do, the Venetians would bounce back from this defeat and the two sides would sign a treaty the following year. The funny thing about the almost definitely false Marco Polo connection to the island is that it's basically unnecessary. Look, this is Korchler as viewed from the hill above. I mean, who? Who is going to look at that and say, well, this sucks? I mean, it's not just one of the most exquisitely preserved and immersive Venetian towns anywhere. Even aside from its history, it's just unrealistically beautiful. On a personal note, my wife, Jen, who I occasionally use as a proxy for normal people who don't have an obsession with the Venetian Republic or don't bring up the despotate of Epirus in conversation unprompted. This stands out as one of her favorite spots that we've been to, um, and we're gonna have to return one day, though goodness knows when. So, after all that preamble, let's pick apart the Venetian highlights of Korchla. First of all, the distinctive defences. Uh, sea walls have a horrible habit of getting torn down in the 1800s or early 1900s to make space for wide waterfront boulevards. Now, while the western side of Korchla suffered this to make way for a hotel, its sea walls are mostly still there. The walls were begun in the 12 and 1300s, and while you can see some very sturdy Venetian additions, they do also maintain a degree of their medieval character too. Towers like the Zakajan, while noticeably restored, are of an older design than the angular Venetian artillery defences that emerged from the sort of 1500s onwards. Beginning on the western side, you have this huge round bastion and tower. This is the Velika Kneza Kula, or simply translated, large governor's tower. And that was built in 1483, and behind it, the small governor's tower from 1449. Moving around, you've got the Canavelic Tower, built in 1485 to 1488, and round from that, that's the Zakajan, built around 1483, and similar in design, though the battlements have clearly been restored quite heavily. This actually has a bar on top of it, which is just the most incredible place to get a drink. The walls on the eastern side are not quite as easy to see as they are lined with restaurant tables and trees, but if you descend down to the water's edge, they are much clearer. While not as impressive as the Governor's Tower on the western side, the east also matches it with a seaward bastion. This is the Tower of All Saints, which was undergoing work when we were there. 
While we're discussing the fortifications, it's worth commenting that unlike the ruinous destruction of Var in 1571, despite an assault from the same Ottoman navy, Korchler managed to largely escape the worst of the destruction, partly thanks to a storm rolling in, but due in no small part to the valiant defence of the locals. There's a lengthy account by Anton Rosanovic, which has been translated into English. You can read that here, I'll put a link in the description. Finally, we arrive back at the gate, again, fairly well preserved with the tower of the land gate from about the 1200s. If you pass through this, you have the Ducal Palace on the left, originally built in 1520. This is tucked inside the Governor Tower. Opposite that is the tiny church of St. Michael from at least as early as 1408, but restored in 1615. In fact, this whole square is just a perfect time capsule movie set kind of a place. I mean, being there first thing in the morning when there was no one around except for this sleepy cat, that felt amazing. You know what? I'm just going to slip in a quick supercut here. Then, walking through the tight streets, you shortly reach the square with St. Mark's Cathedral. This is particularly beautiful. While work began as far back as 1301, it was largely finished in the 1400s. You can see an unusually ornate tower and cupola, completed by Marco and Didic in 1481, and the view from the top of the tower is exquisite. And you know we've got to, let's have a supercut. Just one more thing before we depart. While the town of Korchler is very much self-contained within the fortifications, there is a final piece of the puzzle. This tower on the hill above the town, not open to go in, this is the Forteca Svetog Vlaha. Now, I had this slightly wrong. While there was originally a Venetian fortification here, and at a glance it certainly looks pretty Venetian, this is in fact a rebuild by the British, of all people, from 1815. Following the Napoleonic Wars, where the Dalmatian coast had been conquered and incorporated into the short-lived Illyrian province, the British Navy captured the island of Korchler in 1813. And while they wouldn't be there for long, they built quite a bit of significant infrastructure, including a new pier, roads, and yes, this tower. We've mentioned before that there's some quite interesting history with the Napoleonic Wars and then the period of Austrian control along the Croatian Adriatic, but it's past 1797, so it's a bit out of our wheelhouse for these Venetian episodes. Anyway, that's our cue to wrap up with Lion Watch quite a selection of silly ones this week. It's sometimes hard to tell the age of some of these, it's not always info that's easy to come by. Starting on VAR, there are a couple on the fort that are pretty battered. This one on the southeastern tower, and you can at least make out the tail on this one on the western tower. Down lower, there's these on the side of the Logia. They do look a bit too crisp, not a lot of corrosion from exposure to the elements, so these may be more recent. I can't find a dating citation. They're both about as comic as you can get. Doesn't appear to be an attempt to strike fear into the hearts of men with the mighty lions of St. Mark. Yeah. Gotta zoom a bit tight on these. How did I not get a decent shot? Uh, there's also these two above the main entrance of the Logia, which is a hotel now. Um, built a short distance away and... And oh boy, what is this? Dr. Zeus, Dr. Zeus. Dr. Zeus, Dr. Zeus. No, really, it looks like it was carved from the Simpsons Planet of the Apes musical. What is any of this? It's right up there with some of the silliest lions that we've seen. But it hardly stops there, because if we head over to Korchula, firstly, there was a massive one here on the large governor's tower, but it was replaced by this plaque commemorating World War II. There's this less than especially convincing specimen on the Tower of the Land Gate, another that seems to cross the line from lion to ape with its heavy jawline. Inside, the annex to the Governor's Palace has a couple on display. This is actually not too bad, though with the face gone, hard to tell. I mean, the bodies of these lions are usually not too bad. It's the faces that normally go wrong. And yes, right on cue. And look, yeah, sure, this has some damage, but I feel like I should flash up the symptoms of a stroke, you know, just as a public health warning. Yeah, don't know what's happened there. 
further into the town, and if Split, Trogir, and Shibanik taught us anything, then the outside of the cathedral is usually the best place to catch some bad lions. And, oh, what's this? I think we're actually closer to the Guardians of Zul than lions. And, look, again, with monkey ears? Seriously? Uh, scattered through the town, there's still more. A pretty weak attempt here, but not unlike a lot of medieval designs. But then, what is this? That... That is an upset sheep. That is that is not a lion. You're turning lions into lambs. That is some AI levels of nonsense. This one's somewhere on the eastern edge of the town by the water. That's almost quite cute, if disregarding the fact it appears to be blowing a raspberry at all of us. I do feel bound to point out that while, yes, a lot of this sculpting ineptitude no doubt arises from lions being in short supply in the Adriatic during the Middle Ages, but with no shortage of cats around town, even just using one of them as reference and then just bushing out the main would have yielded better results. I mean, what an absolutely bonkers week for not lions. Do I need to remind people this was taking place during the time of the Renaissance? You're telling me in the centuries where Greco-Roman style sculpture was at its pinnacle, they couldn't spare one workshop to pop out a decent lion occasionally? Anyway, that's it. I might just leave a small space here for a short video on Bratch and the other islands in the region, while Var and Korchla are, by several orders of magnitude, the most significant fortresses in the area. My curiosity to get to some of the more minor settlements and islands is almost certainly going to lead me to making a second pass around these parts to see more. So once we've finished this season for the first time, there'll probably be some follow-up videos filling in some gaps. In the meantime, do check out more in the playlist. The next major settlement along the coast is Dubrovnik, and I mentioned our two episodes on the Republic of Ragusa. While not a Venetian holding, well, at least not for very long, it's a fascinating story and a missing piece to the Venetian story in the Adriatic, so I put that in the playlist as well. So check those, and after that, we're actually going to be leaving what is now Croatia behind after six episodes and heading into Montenegro. It's only going to get even better from here. The Montenegro Venetian cities are frankly ridiculous. Meanwhile, the music you've been hearing in the background is ours. We create all the tracks for these episodes and you can find them on bandcap.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Please find us on all the socials and otherwise we'll catch you very soon.